Hello and welcome back to my RC channel. I'm Andy RC and today I'm going to be taking a look at the iFlight CineB 4K Whoop. First of all, I want to thank everybody for watching my Gap RC CinePro 4K video. I've not had those kind of views for a while. And for you guys that bought the model after watching the video, you might be feeling quite nervous now, so let me put you at ease. When I flew the Gap RC model, I knew nothing would be able to beat it. It would only be able to match it. So now I'm going to do the Jeremy Clarkson thing and tell you where in which areas the iFlight is better than the Gap RC. The Cinebeat 4K is lighter, coming in at 107 grams without a battery compared to the 132 grams of the Gap RC model. It also comes with a circular polarized Foxia lollipop antenna rather than a linear antenna. The Tarsier board is mounted at the back and upside down, which gives us access to the micro SD card slot, whereas on the Gap RC model, the protectors block it, and you have to push the protector down in order to access it. The iFlight protectors come in a black colour, so when you land it in grass, it doesn't turn them green, unlike the clear protectors you get with the Gap RC model. The CineB also has a smaller footprint, being slightly shorter in length and width. We also have got some built-in landing feet, which is a nice touch, and just like the Gap RC model, the protectors are not integral to the frame. The props are a 2-inch 2025 by the well-known HQ brand, so it's a better model than the Gap RC Cine Pro 4K, right? No. First of all, a problem is the motor choice. They are a B-Rotor Naked Bottom 1104-8300kV. Yep, 8300kV. And that means that it's a 2 to 3S model only. Now, the fact that it's a 3S model isn't the issue here. It's actually the opposite to what you might think. If we take 8300kV and times that by a fully charged 3S LiPo, which is 12.6 volts, that translates into 104,580 RPM without a prop load. And if we take the 5000 kV of the 1105 stator motor from the GEP RC model and times that by a fully charged 4S, which is 16.8 volts, we get just 84,000 RPM. So that's a good thing, right? The Cine B is going to have more RPMs on a 3S than the Cine Pro has on a 4S. Therefore, we'll get more thrust. Yes, but... That's actually a problem. Think about what we've learned from over the years. In the 5-inch and the 3-inch world, we are now seeing 6S equivalent models because the 4S equivalent RPM was giving too much voltage sag, so it was damaging the lipos, and at the same time, you were losing performance because when your voltage sags, your RPM sags. And I think that's what we are going to see with this model on a 3S. It's going to rev even higher than the GEP RC does on a 4S. And with less number of cells, it's going to have more voltage sag. Either that or there will be so much thrust that the flight times will be very short. They are recommending a 300 milliamp to 600 milliamp LiPo, but are not detailing the cell number. So I'm going to try the 650 milliamp GMB LiPo for 3S and see how I get on. The same goes for 2S on the CineB versus the 3S that I used on the Gap RC model, which allowed me to fly that indoors. So 8,300 kV on a 2S results in 69,720 RPM against the 3S on the GEP RC which is 63,000 RPM. I'm not even sure I have a 2S LiPo of the correct size to even test that either. The protectors are black, but they definitely flex more than the Gap RC model. After the review of the Cine Pro, I did push the protector as far as it would go to get the micro SD card out, and it did eventually snap one of the struts. But it took a lot of force, and so far, none of the others have broken in a crash. Then I was like, what did you do that for? This is like your favourite model. Things that I do for this channel. 
The main frame is made out of carbon fibre, so you can take the protectors off to have an unprotected 2-inch model. But again, you would have to unscrew the motors and use some shorter screws to stop them shorting on the back of the motor. At first, I thought they had provided shorter screws with this bag of spares, but all of the screws are too long. Now, I mentioned the Tarsier being at the back, a positive thing, but it's also a negative as the stop and start record button is now quite difficult to reach. I'm not going to go over all of the features of the Tarsier again in this video. I will link to the Gap RC CinePro 4K video for that. But something else that they have done which I'm not too keen on is they have mounted the camera with its ribbon connector exposed at the bottom and this cable is very fragile so they should have flipped it around because you can flip it around in the app otherwise it's going to get torn off in a heavy crash. The Tarsier camera also has a quite narrow field of view in 4K and at the bottom we've got this standoff which is stopping the camera from being completely flat. Now flying outdoors isn't going to be a problem but if you're trying to do some indoor work then you may end up with some footage looking up at the sky. The reason I say this is because even though the Gap RC model has nothing to restrict it. I pointed the camera slightly upwards for the indoor flight and I did lose field of view at the bottom. I suppose you could remove this bottom standoff but you may lose integrity of the frame. This next one is another disappointment. Now I assumed with the frame being carbon fibre that they would have mounted the camera directly to it but they haven't. If you look close there is a small 3D printed TPU insert and TPU is bad news for these cameras. I'm not sure why they have done it. Maybe the Jello was worse with the camera bolted directly to the carbon. All I know is that this aluminium solution from Gap RC is bulletproof when it comes to Jello. So I don't think that's going to work. You also can't get to the screw to change the camera angle unless you remove the front two ducts. Whereas, oh, I'm tired of completing this sentence. <laughs> And just a final word on the implementation of the Tarsier here. The connector for the controller board is easily accessible. It's mounted at the back and they have provided the controller in the package for you. And it's come set up in 4x3 mode. So onto the stack and it's iFlight's own 16x16 success tower. Now this tower itself can accept a 2 to 4 S voltage, it's just the motors that can't. So the ESCs are a 4-in-1 BL Halley S with D-Shot 600. They are only 12 amp each, but when you do the calculations, the 35 amp on the Gap RC model are a little bit overkill. It's just important to note that the Gap RC model that I reviewed is the advanced version. So it's more expensive than the standard version and also more expensive than the Cinebi. So this one's flight controller is an F4 and not an F7. And because it's mounted up front, you can't access the USB port. So they've included this 90 degree adapter, but as you can see, the protector is still in the way of that. So I knew once this thing was in, I needed to get my setup right because I had a feeling that on the way out it's going to take the USB connector with it and guess what? It did. You can't see it because I've attempted to solder it back on but it stripped off the USB solder pads so there is no saving it. Luckily I got enough things set up so that it would arm but I can't really touch it from here other than what you can do through the on-screen display. It's come flash with Betaflight version 3.57, so it looks like they haven't come up with a good Betaflight 4 setup for it. Its PID loop frequency is 8K 2K, so I've changed that to 8K 8K. But other than that, everything in the config page was set up okay with air mode, anti-gravity and dynamic filters turned on, as well as the max arming angle set to 180 and D-Shot commands are set up to both beacon and signal loss. It does look like there is a custom PID profile in there, but no second profile. So you would think that the PIDs that were put in place would work for both 3S and 2S. 
the item relax is turned off so I'll have to see what effect that has and in the modes tab angle mode is permanently on suggesting that they don't want you to even try acro with this guy so of course I changed that. <laughs> the on-screen display layout is in the middle of the screen, which is a bit strange. Of course, with the USB port broken, I can't change that now. There are no spare UARTs, and it's using a virtual COM port for the USB, so it will take a lot of messing around to get the USB working again. And if I were a customer, I'd just be sending it back. There is no current meter and they have got the RSSI turned on in the on-screen display but it's disabled in the receiver tab. So that made me wonder about the receiver itself. Now the box has come marked as having an FR Sky XM Plus included. However, after checking the config tab before the USB port broke, I could see that it is set up as Spectrum in Betaflight. I've had this before with iFlight products actually so be wary of that. Luckily, I have have a DSMX module for my X9D but I don't like to fly DSMX that much because it's the only protocol I've ever had a fly away with. The receiver is housed in a TPU mount. With it being DSMX you can use the bind commands in the CLI. I can't though because I can no longer get to the CLI so I had to remove the top and luckily there is a bind button. If there wasn't I don't think I'd have been able to review this guy. Another giveaway that it's not FR Sky, of course, is the size of the receiver, but also the length of the antennas. There is a 3D printed mount for the antennas to feed through, but the DSMX antennas aren't long enough to feed through. They also provide straws for longer antennas, but again, I won't be needing those. So above the broken flight controller we have a switch in VTX via the Tramp protocol. It has got pit mode and goes up to 200 milliwatt. The antenna is connected via a micro UFL connector which is not secured down. Another thing I'm not happy about is all of the LiPo straps that they have provided aren't long enough for any of the LiPos that they've recommended. So this red iFlight strap is off another one of their bigger models. There's also no anti-slip mat provided so the screws in the top plate are just going to dig into my LiPo. So left in the box are some iFlight stickers as well as spare stickers to wrap around the protectors. You're given a spare set of props but no manual and that's your lot. This is some DVR footage of an indoor flight that I did on a 2S 450mA GMB LiPo. You can see the voltage 8.4 volts is correct for a fully charged 2S LiPo so they have got the scaling right and you can see the strange placement of the icons of the on-screen display. The only thing that is missing from that is the RSSI value. I was able to remove that through the on-screen display but otherwise that would be flashing because this receiver does not have RSSI output. The next thing that I noticed is a slight ripple of noise. So this is the FPV cam that we are looking through. And I think what is causing that is the XT30 connector. It's running very close to the 5.8 gigahertz antenna. And if you remember from the Ishim Wizard X220HV review that I did, it had that exact same issue. And I think it would be an easy fix. You just need to move the XT30 connector away from the VTX and the antenna. So onto the HD footage. And I like to record in 1440p, which is a four by three aspect ratio. Now this might seem strange and I didn't really explain this enough in my CinePro 4K video. But this is where I think the improvements have been made with this camera. There's a 1440p option and then you can dynamically stretch the image and get a ultra wide field of view. So for me this is what the Tarsier camera has brung and of course the super low latency of the FPV camera. Now, speaking about the iFlight model, I was really surprised how well it flew indoors. You can hear from the audio we're getting a slight rattle, and I'm going to do the classic mirror shot there, but see if you can listen out for the rattle. I think that is just the ducts maybe vibrating because they aren't quite as strong. 
But yeah, I was actually quite surprised. The performance was good on 2S. I could fly around the house and the throttle wasn't too crazy. But I don't think it was as stable as the GEP RC model. And the flight time certainly wasn't as long. Look at this. We are 2 minutes 21 in and we are at 7 volts. But all of a sudden the voltage drops really quickly. So doing the mirror shut and if we look back to the DVR it is going to all of a sudden just drop really quickly and then flash so under a three minute flight time on this lipo now of course a 450 milliamp 2s lipo isn't really big enough hence the short flight time but i don't have anything bigger and it's a really strange size to have in a 2s with an xt30 these days the motors were super hot as well whether that was on a 2s lipo or a 3s not only that but this is an F4 board, and just like the F7 that I had with the GEP RC, if you leave it plugged in too long, whether that's via the USB or via a LiPo, if you don't fly, then eventually you get a core temp warning. So it seems like it's not just limited to the F7 boards with them getting hot and no airflow going around them so make sure first of all be careful with the usb in fact knowing what i know now i'd even remove the protector just to get the setup right and then make sure that you've got a fan blowing on the flight controller at the same time otherwise it's going to overheat this next flight was done on a 3s 650 milliamp gmb lipo and from this point on the HD footage is going to be the 1440p 4x3 image dynamically stretched with editing software which unfortunately as I mentioned in my Runcam 5 video I can't show you how to do. Hopefully somebody who has more luck with YouTube's community guidelines will be able to show you how to do it easily. Anyways on to the CineB 4K. And the first thing I noticed was outside, the ripples of noise were more noticeable. However, it was flying really nicely. I've got it in acro mode here, and it's not tricking out whatsoever. And I think I know why that is. You see, I am using a fairly lightweight 3S LiPo for this model, 650 milliamp, and it gets quite a short flight time, I think just about three minutes. Anyways, none of that really matters. I'm about to join Team Failsafe, and this is why I don't like to fly Spectrum anymore. Up on the throttle to do a inverted yaw spin, and I get a failsafe, and it lands in the ground. Amazingly, though, quite a high tumble and nothing broken. So, on to the next flight. So, I went to recharge my battery, and this next flight is done on the same 3S 650 milliamp GMB LiPo. And I took it a little bit more steady at first because the sun was starting to shine through the clouds. So, periodically, you'll see me point at the sun to see if there is any jello, and there was, in fact, there are minimal amounts of jello all throughout the flight despite it being pretty cloudy and I put that down to that TPU mount. It did fly pretty nice but in some of the recoveries there were some prop wash especially towards the end of the lipo and that's not to be confused with your washout. Now I've heard people say with their version that they bought they are getting your washout and when I ask them well what lipo are you using they say it's an 850 milliamp 3s and yeah I think that would cause your washouts you're adding more weight which means the model has to lift more weight and it has to work harder to power out of those acro maneuvers. Now, if you are just into cruising around and not doing acro, then an 850 milliamp 3S LiPo would probably be fine and give you a longer flight time. But once you have flown the GEP RC model, there is no going back. So for me, there are some key changes that need to happen to this model. First of all, put much lower KV motors on it that are 4S compatible. You then don't have to rev the nuts off the motors on an inferior number of cells, which 
produces thrust for sure but it shortens the flight time and the motors get too hot to touch. People are after these models for jello free footage and at this level it could even be used in a professional manner. You could say well I'll just get the ND filter for the Tarsier and if you bought this model then that should sort a lot of the jello problems out. But there is another model that doesn't need an ND filter. The USB position and the 90 degree adapter not fitting needs a better solution. I guarantee you iFlight guys the return rate on that will be massive because I was so careful but that USB connector on the board if you take it all apart it covers the entire board and there is so little traces for the solder to keep that USB connector in place that it's inevitable if you're going to pull the 90 degree connector out of the side it's going to rip the traces off and that's what happened. And last of all make sure that the receiver is the one written on the box. I'm a YouTuber so I've got all of these backups for if I'm sent the wrong thing but not everybody has. So there you go that is my review of the iFlight Cine B 4K. It's a good effort but right now I'd go and grab yourself the Gap RC Cine Pro 4K until further notice. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.